bench. Today we're going to be doing a build on a Conrail C36-7, number 6627. So this is a build using a shell I picked up off eBay last year. Uh, I think I got it from Pacific Northwest Resins if I'm remembering correctly. This is a pretty simple build because you can pretty much use an Atlas C30-7 as a donor unit for your parts, etc. So first thing I'm doing here is I'm taking the shell and I'm cleaning up all the like, flashing from around the windows, the steps, all that stuff with the knife you guys can see there. Just kind of cleaning all that stuff up, that way uh, all that flashing's off and it'll just kind of make things easier as we go along here. Um, these shells are pretty much a drop-on fit for the uh, Atlas C30-7 U30C motor and drive assembly, so uh, I think you might have to trim the weight a little bit, depending on if you can keep that or not, but I don't use the weights, I take them all off, so. Now once I get uh, all that flashing cleaned off and start drilling all my holes for all of my uh, marker lights, headlights, all that fun stuff, etc. So now as you guys can see, I'm going ahead and drilling out all of them marker and rear headlight holes. I do that on the front and the back of the locomotive obviously. You gotta do both ends at the same time. Okay. Depending on uh, where I'm drilling out at, sometimes I drill with a smaller bit first and I come back in with a bigger one. Uh, right now I'm doing all the little grab iron holes, the one of those little, uh, oh gosh, I think it's like a 78 bit is the size you use for all those, all the grab irons on the hood, um, all your stuff for your cut levers on the front, all those little holes, windshield wipers, I also drill out on the sides for the handrails, because um, another nice part about this shell, as I mentioned earlier, you, you can take a lot of approach from the C3-7, I'm actually going to use the handrails from a C3-7 on this, so I don't have to bend my own and go through that whole uh, spiel of doing that, because uh, I don't mind doing that, I'm, I'm kind of getting a little bit better at it, but uh, I'm still not that great at it, so kind of do it at times when uh, I really need to. Now what I'm doing is I'm taking little pieces of styrene and I'm covering up the holes for the uh, headlights and the marker lights for how I melt my LEDs. Uh, what I do is I take that styrene and I put it over the hole and I drill a small hole through that to feed my LED wires through, but the uh, styrene will keep the LED inside the hole for the um, lights. And it's just kind of been the simplest way I've found to do this to where I'm not uh, having too much trouble. I'm just using some CA glue to secure that styrene down. Um, and then too, if I ever need to pull out and replace a light bulb or something, I could pull that piece of styrene off the inside of the shell. Fairly easy, but it keeps it in its place. And now we're starting our disassembly here on our donor locomotive. Pulling all the wires off, we gotta pull the weights off on these uh, C3-7s. The weights are secured with the bottom side of the locomotive. Also pulling out that uh, DCC ready works. We're not going to need that where we're going, fellas. We don't need those. Just getting this down to a bare uh, frame. Gonna take the trucks off, the drive shafts, and all that fun stuff there. Now I'm doing my test bit to make sure that my shell is going to fit. And uh, sometimes you got to do a little trimming to get it to sit down on the rig, as I did there. Now the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to remove the side frames from the trucks here. And uh, I do that for a few reasons here. As you guys can tell, it's a little bit of a pain in the rear end to get them off. But, um, one of the reasons you do is to paint your wheels as well as to um, solder the uh, wire from onto the like uh, copper pickup that's for the power pickup. These from the factory have like a plastic clip that holds the wire in place. And I, I don't like things like that where it's just kind of held in place. I'd rather... Um, take and, and solder that on and of course naturally you know I got the camera set up and I managed to miss the part where I'm actually uh, painting the sides of the wheels but this is one of those things I'll do where I'll, I'll pull the truck apart I'll paint the wheels and then while the paint's dry I go back through and I, I solder those connections on there this is also a great time if you can source some uh, dash 8 truck side frames they're actually a little bit better look for these units than the factory C30-7 ones. I didn't, unfortunately, because Atlas is out of them, but maybe you have a set laying around. 
you could swap those out right now while you're doing this because they are actually a drop-in fit um, on these three axle G trucks on these Atlas units. They're kind of all intermixable with that stuff. All right, now we're getting into uh, while I'm waiting things for dry, I'm waiting for some stuff to dry here. I'm having that moment where I'm going on now. The uh, radiator section doesn't fit on my uh, C36-7 from my C30-7, and uh, that's because it's a B23-7 radiator shell size on the uh, B36-7. That's the size from Atlas. I thought I had one, but I don't. So what I'm doing is I'm actually taking the uh, radiator section from the uh, C30-7. I cut it in half and I'm pretty much going to graft it to fit on the shell. I got to do a little mod work to get those pieces to sit down there. But all I'm doing, I got to cut it in half and I'm going to glue one side on, I'll glue the other side on, and then I'll take a piece of strip styrene, the very thin, and put it right down the middle to make it look like the C36-7. Uh, radiator section, even though it's not correct, uh, you'd be much better off if you could find one from a B23-7 to put on there. Unfortunately, I didn't have one of those at this time, so I just kind of had to make it work and work with what I had there. And these, of course, the uh, camera didn't pick that up, but you can see there's both sides of that on there. Well, there's one side of it, there's the other side. And I'll let all that dry. I'm going to reassemble my trucks while I'm waiting for that uh, CA glue to dry on the shell there. I also put a little bit of uh, gear oil, a little bit of that Bell oil stuff in there too while I have the trucks dis disassembled. Just to, I already got the thing on taken apart, I might as well put some oil in there and lube it up a little bit too. And put my uh, drive shafts back in, worm gears, all that fun stuff. Now what I'm doing is I'm assembling an exhaust stack from uh, High tech details, I think, is who makes those. Oh, I'm having a having a brain fart here, fellas. I'm pretty sure it's high tech details who makes those, but it's a uh, dash seven style exhaust stack. I prefer it over the factory Atlas ones. They look a little bit more crisp, a little bit better. As you can see, I'm having to modify the shell a little bit to get to fit on there. putting that piece of uh, sheet styrene down the middle of the radiator section here. Gluing it in place so you guys can kind of see it there. So not the correct piece, but one that works for what I'm doing. Now I'm preparing my uh, snow plow from Details West. I can't remember what part number that is, but it's a Details West snow plow and I'm kind of trimming up the edges a little bit to get it to match the Conrail ones. Uh, the Details West plows right out of the box look pretty good but you gotta kind of trim up the edges a little bit because these Conroe units had the third rail or the electric or well gosh what is it um, I, mean, I can't remember if it was like for third rail clearance or what but they had one on there like a special edge cut for some reason and uh, those were a little bit different shape than the one from details was so now I'm drilling out the top of that plow for the uh, grab irons I believe while I was rambling there, I also drilled the holes in the front to mount the plow. So I go ahead and put our grab irons on the top of our plow before we install it. Right, another fun part here, I got some uh, brass steps uh, here for this from Canon and Company. Or maybe they're Canon, I don't know who that makes these. But uh, they're Brass steps. They're actually for a camera, but for a C32-8, or if they're for a uh, B40-8, they're for a different model than the C36-7. But I went ahead and I cut out my other steps. And now I'm placing those steps in the place because they're a little bit thinner. They look a little bit better. So just kind of getting those glued in place and good to go there.
be a little bit tricky to get those steps to fit in there because you got to cut out enough of the factory step but uh, leave a little bit along the edge for the new steps to sit on um, have a bit of a pain in the rear end but looks really good when it's done because how much thinner those brass steps are still fit in those steps and for these steps I'm using CA glue to um, attach them in place that's uh, what the um, what's on my little uh, piece of cardboard over there I just put a little CA glue on there and I could dip the edges of the steps in the cardboard makes it a little bit easier I just buy the uh, big giant bottles of CA glue when I buy it I don't get the little ones just because how much of it I go through so it's easier just to pour it on a scrap piece of uh, cardboard, like the little cardboard things that come with the low sound speakers and all that. To save those, you could just pour a little bit of glue out on them. And now we're popping our handrails off of our donor shell. So I'm going to go ahead and pull all the grab irons off the donor shell as well while I'm at it. That way I could start fitting them in place. That was part of the reason I took the handrails off first so I didn't damage them too much while I was uh, working on getting those um, grab irons off to move them over. But we already drilled all the holes. That's the nice thing about these um, Pacific Northwest resin shells, if you can find them anymore, is they have a little indentation that you can uh, put your drill bit in that you could drill out the holes with so it's, it's pretty nice to work with and that way these atlas uh grab irons are pretty much like a direct crossover to uh this shell i go ahead and do the same whole spiel on the other on the uh, long hood end kind of nice when you can use um, parts from the donor shell as much as you can that way you're not going through your supply of other detail parts like grab irons and such and uh, cut levers and everything be a bit of a shame that I'll have you know half a C3 S7 shell laying in a in the uh, supply box but you never know when you might need some of that so Also, while I have, uh, while I'm swapping all these over, also doing like the cut levers too, if I haven't mentioned that already. Doing the uh, cut levers and all that fun jazz down there on the bottom of the um, sills and all that. That's part of the reason I tried to drill as much of this stuff out as I could before I did the steps, because once you put those steps on the end, it kind of weakens the end of the shell a little bit. So. I try to make sure I have all the holes drilled that I possibly can need and then I come through and uh, do all that. Now we're putting on our uh, handrails here. Since I drilled out all the holes for them, they pretty much drop right on there and I'm CA gluing them on because the shell doesn't come apart anyway so there's, there, to me there's no real purpose in uh, trying to um, leave them to where I can take them off. I mean they're just going to fall off. so. I just went ahead and glued them on. Some of the holes were a little bit too small, so I'm drawing them out a hair bigger. But I just used a little CA glue and CA glue them in place. This is kind of one of the later steps to detailing is uh, putting all these on, these handrails on. Now the front handrails can be a little bit tricky. You can kind of try and drill the anti-climber a little bit like what I'm doing here to try and get them to sit down in it a little bit. but. Um, it's always a bit of a challenge to get these handrails to sit on the front like that because they're not, they're, on the regular C30-7 there's no anti-climber so 
This set of handrails, you have to kind of cut the bottom of them almost flush, but then I like to drill a little bit of a hole down to the top of the anti-climber so that way they sit down in it and I can see a glue it in place. Um, again, it's not going to be the strongest thing in the world, but um, it's just kind of the simplest way about it without having to hand bend handrails for it. And sometimes I'm in for that and sometimes I'm not, and this is one of those times that I was not in the mood to bend handrails. So. Got that on there, gotta let that glue dry a little bit. And while that glue's drying up there, I'm gonna go ahead and install some of my details up on the roof. Uh, little antenna, as well as a horn. Gotta do all that fun stuff. A little um, Sinclair antenna, I think was for the radios and the locomotives. And of course our uh, Leslie horns gotta go on there as well while we're at it. But if you guys can't tell, I try to like, you know, do things and some sort of an order but at the same time I'm trying to work on one area and then while glue's drying on that I could work on another area and just try to keep things moving right along so uh, one of the things these shells is kind of missing is there's like a little like rain edge up along the top face of the shell and what I do is I use like a little piece of metal from a resistor one of those little um oh gosh I don't remember I don't know what you'd call that the little uh metal pieces on each end of it they're kind of long and very thin wire like i'll take that and i'll glue it along the edge of the shell there to make that work right now i'm putting in all my holes for my mu hoses of course i managed to you know hold the locomotive in the spot the camera doesn't pick up because as you guys can tell i'm pretty good at that but i'm drilling all the holes for the mu hoses uh the knuckle all that fun jazz and putting the horn and the plow on so now we're painting we're going in i'm doing a coat of black first you guys can tell i paint the inside paint the bottom and i paint the outside now the reason i go with black specifically is um it helps prevent light bleed which can be a bit of a problem with some shells so i, I always like to come in and do black first and then I do my blue over the top of it this is a pretty abbreviated example but I'm using scale coat paints can't get them anymore of course but now we have uh, our shell back and as you can see there's a C32-H shell sitting up there too I was working at both of these at the same time so what I'm gonna do now is I'm going in and doing all my hand painting work and um, that consists of pretty much painting like the uh, walkways and all that I'm just using some black acrylic paint here to paint the walkways the front of the pilot area of the locomotive and just getting a pretty heavy coat of black on everything uh, I'll have to come back through and you know touch up little spots and stuff but this is just getting a good heavy base coat down um, trying to tape all this off and paint it that way with an airbrush is just a little bit too much hassle for my taste so I just come in and very carefully try to paint this. You always end up goofing up and get a little bit of paint on the side of the locomotive, but it is what it is. Normally you could clean it up pretty good, and if anything, the weathering will hide it. Uh, these ones that I film, I really try to do a good job with, so it doesn't look too bad, but, you know, that's part of the fun of it. I, I suppose you could do this before you put the handrails on, but the problem would be then you got to paint the handrails separate. And, I'm sure I'm not the only one that's fought with trying to paint handrails separate from a locomotive, so that's part of the reason I haven't glued on already, but just going ahead and getting a good coat. Um, with the acrylic paint, a lot of times it'll be kind of thin in spots, you'll have to go back and touch it up anyway, so you just get a good base coat down and let it dry, and you could always fix it up later a little bit. Now I have my white paint, I'm going through and doing all my grab irons, a um, little... Uh, the edges of the steps all that fun stuff um, always refer to your prototype photos to kind of guide you through this um, this particular unit was a uh, I don't think this ever got repainted actually this was a factory painted unit that uh, survived all the way to the end of Conrail and its factory uh, can opener logo from the 80s so all right now we're letting our paint dry we're gonna go ahead and start our decoder installation and all that fun jazz so for the purposes of this video, I'm using a Loke Sound Select Direct decoder. 
As you guys can tell here, I have to build my little mount for my uh, speaker and keep alive here on the envelope. And I'm just using styrene and just gluing it in place. Just making myself a little platform for my speaker to sit on here. I do that on the uh, long hood end. And uh, what I'll do is I'll take and drill holes in that little uh, table kind of deal I'm making there. So that way the wires from the trucks can come through. And um, I do this on both ends of the locomotive, you not really need to. The reason being is it helps keep any of the wires, if they come loose, um, for our lights and all that, it keeps all those wires from falling down into the drive shafts or any of that and getting tangled up and hitting on all that. So um, I tend to just put them on both ends on these bigger units. I'm like a GP38, I wouldn't bother, but uh, on a locomotive this large, I, I do that. Sometimes I'll add weight if it fits in there as well on those uh, spots. Right now I'm making my uh, sound chamber here. I'm using two of the uh, little cube speakers from ESU. And what I do is I, I take um, their little pieces they give you and I kind of combine them into one larger sound chamber to try and get better sound. It comes out pretty good. But it's just the little pieces from two of those kits put together to make one large sound chamber, essentially, that'll share for both speakers. Now I use a little bit of canopy, uh, the, I use a little bit of canopy glue to secure the speaker to the actual sound chamber. Uh, I had some problems using CA glue because, well, it, it has like that residue on it when it dries. It leaves that like whitish film residue around in places, so... Now while our speaker's drying, I am gluing my, uh, I'm kind of letting the, uh, no, what the heck, the, uh, little pieces from my table are kind of hold together. As you can see, we put a few weights in the front end of the locomotive there, where it fits, just to add a little bit more pulling power to it. Now I'm going through and I'm feeding all my wires through my shell for, uh, all of my different lights I'm going to have here for my headlights. Uh, marker weights, stitch lights, etc. Um, one of the little things I'll do is I'll feed those wires through and then I tape them down. And then uh, I kind of put them all together and I tape together the different wires and I label them. That way I can put all my wires in and I have everything ready to go so that way when I do my uh, soldering work to the uh, decoder board, all the wires are already fed through. I'm not trying to hook up one set of wires and then trying to feed more through um, while that's uh, partially connected to the um, decoder board and everything. It just makes life a little bit simpler doing it this way. And as you guys kind of can kind of see in there, I'm trying to keep my um, wires kind of neat in there. I don't want wires moving around too much. So I try to keep them centered and keep them taped down. That way they don't uh, end up all over the place. So when you're doing uh, this level of lighting, you end up with a lot of wires, just a bunch, because you got, you know, you got two LEDs for the headlights, two for the number boards, two for the marker lights, and two for the ditch lights. That's eight LEDs per end of locomotive, depending on what you're doing. And well, you times that number by two to know how many wires you got. So. That's going to be 16 wires on each end. That's kind of ridiculous. So 32 wires total. The more neat you can keep everything and tape down, the better off you're going to be. Now at some point here, I didn't note it because I didn't notice it. I put my uh, windows in. The window glazing from the uh, other shell. Went ahead and got that all put in there probably before I did my... Um, start putting my lights in there. As you can see, we're still feeding those wires through. It takes a little bit of time to do that. Um, one thing I want to note here for anybody that's still watching this 26-minute uh, long video so far. Um, I do these videos. I literally put everything in here. I don't cut anything out. I speed it all up. And the reason being is I don't, like, I, I want everyone that watches this to be able to watch this entire thing and see exactly how a locomotive is built and not have things cut out and missing that's you know some things i forget to put in you know like the window glazing but it, it should be in here somewhere in this video but um i do that so there's nothing hidden you know i i don't hide 
you know, any parts of this. There's there's nothing more complicated than what you're seeing. It's all very simple stuff. It just takes a lot of time to do it all. So looks like we're putting our marker light wires in now. But um, and then too, if somebody wants to see something in particular, everything's in here. And um, I can kind of, if anybody has any questions, I can always explain them in the comments if needed and kind of go back and touch it over. But literally everything I've done is in this video as far as uh, building this locomotive. So that's kind of an important thing to me because when I got back into the hobby, there wasn't really any like step by step exactly how it is videos. There's always, you know, like do this and then do that. But like you're looking and like that don't look like what it was when it started. So. It, I, I do these this way just to kind of more or less for transparency and all that and for if anybody you know wants to see anything now I start from top to bottom with the lights so I did the headlights first the number board second marker lights third and right now I'm doing the ditch lights that's why it's kind of hard to see here because you got to kind of feed I, I feed the ditch light into the ditch light housing and then I feed the wire through the shell and I glue the ditch light and housing in place on the front at one time. Um, I've never had much luck trying to feed the wires through a ditch light, through a shell, through the steps, wherever to get it through. So I always do that once. Now we're going ahead and we're starting to put this together here. So I'm starting off by wiring my uh, power trucks, the wires from those to the decoder first. Then I'll do my motor wires as well while I'm at it. Doing the rear wires from the trucks. Then I do my uh, speaker wires here as well too. You can see I got a little electrical tape to hold the speaker down. I just kind of roll it up in a circle and put the speaker in place. But I'll take it all up. I'll get those wires on here next. And then I'll start running the wires from all the lights into the uh, decoder as well. Now for these uh, speaker wires, I just use scrap wire I'd laying around from like old decoder installs and stuff. I just try and find wires that are the right length and put them together to uh, work with this that can take a little bit of time. Uh, these speakers are kind of difficult to get the um, wires to stay connected to when you're trying to solder them because they're so small. And if you're not careful, you'll overheat the little piece of uh, metal you're soldering to and it'll pop up. It's kind of frustrating. but just take your time and you usually can get them on there pretty good. I also got my uh, Tipo I've wired in and put on there. Now I'm going through and doing my uh, all my lights. So what I'm doing is I'm hitting headlights, uh, number boards, all that stuff. I'm pretty much starting off at the front and working my way to the back. All of the red wires go together with the way I wire these and then the blue wire from whatever it is is where it has to actually go to its dedicated spot on the board. So normally I'll have like a set of red wires from the back and a set of red wires from the front because there's always at least two of those um, U plus spots on the board I think is what it's labeled as or V plus or whatever it is. And then I'll take you know the two headlight wires go to headlight, the two ditch lights go to each individual ditch light on these uh, selector X I believe it's auxiliary one and two is what I use. The, the number bores are auxiliary three and the marker lights are auxiliary four. I try to do it the same every time, that way I don't uh, mix things up. But you just get all those wires soldered in place. Uh, the nice thing about using this type of LEDs, these cheap ones I picked up off of Amazon, is um, you just hold the insulated end to the soldering iron and the soldering iron is hot enough that it will melt the insulation off it or burn it off or whatever so you're not trying to strip those little wires now i very carefully fit my shell into the my uh all the wiring in there shells on and uh off screen i went ahead and tested this and it worked so now we're on to decals you can see we're doing our big old can opener here So 
taking a little of the, uh, whatever the red stuff is from the micro scale. I don't know if it's micro saw or micro set or what the heck it is. It's the red one. I brush that on there and then uh, take my can opener and put it on the side here. I always like to put that uh, micro saw on there pretty heavy and then it makes the decal kind of slide back and forth nice and easily and, and sit down on there. Um, decaling is one of those things that drives me absolutely nuts doing it but whenever I'm done with decaling a locomotive I'm always really kind of it's kind of like an exciting moment because it looks like something. I gotta go ahead and get my con rails on there. So while what I like to do is I like to cut decals ahead, so to speak. So like while one set of decals is sitting in the water, uh, getting all watered up and ready to put on the unit, I'll cut out my next um, decals that I'm going to be using and get those ready. That way it kind of makes the whole process go a little bit faster. Um, kind of use your time a little bit better. I believe the set I used for the can opener and for the uh, Conrail logos was the uh, GE set from Microscale for Conrail. I can't remember exactly what it's called, but I also had to use the numbers from that because this had the factory GE numbers on it still, which are a little bit smaller and thinner than the standard Conrail numbers. Let me get all the numbers placed. I always start with the logo and then do like the smaller Conrail on the side and then I do all the numbers um, as well as the logos on the front and the end. Kind of let everything kind of dry out and then I could come back and start putting all those really fine little uh, number or yeah, the fine little labels on all the doors and everything. Uh, in the case of these they have like a bunch of high voltage warnings on the uh, conductor side down below the cab there's like one on every little box on the side there all right so I let all that dry and now I'm coming through and doing all the little decals I already let them dry for about an hour the decals will be pretty stable to where if you bump them while you're doing these little ones you're not going to damage anything but um, you just got to take your time. You don't want to rush through doing decals because you can end up messing up your big old can opener on the side trying to put these little ones on if you're not careful. So just referencing my prototype photo and you know finding the little decal on the sheet or finding the closest thing I can. Sometimes I just use whatever's close because you don't always have the little decal you uh, are looking for or Sometimes you can't tell what it's actually supposed to be from the photos you have because uh, they're finding like really up close detail shots from these 90s units is kind of a bit of a tricky part. I can't find very many so I just kind of have to wing it sometimes and then eh, it looks kind of close and I'll just go with that and it's place. It might not be the exact right decal but if it's close and it looks right, I mean who's going to know? Or well, you guys now know. But you know, you, I think y'all know what I'm saying. Sometimes you got to make compromises with this stuff to actually get the deal done. So once this is, uh, once I get these decals on, I'll let them dry for a day or two, and then I'll come in and I'll clear coat. And um, for clear coat on these, since I painted them with scale coat, I'm using scale coats uh, clear flat finish, which again, you can't get anymore because scale coat's not around. But I noticed when using like the Krylon and other type of um, clear coat lacquers, for some reason they'll make the scale coat paint like wrinkle up and it's not cool at all. So for as long as I'm using scale coat paint still for the Conrail Blue, I'm going to have to use that scale coat clear coat, or at least until I run out of it. Um, whenever that day comes, I'm going to have to change what paint color I'm using. So now we're heading over here, we're doing some airbrushing. We're starting off with a fade coat because you guys know you got to fade it down a little bit. Looks like Conroe Blue is pretty bright. Uh, I, of course, I taped up the windows. I kind of, you know, didn't bother showing that. Got a little bit of rail brown going along the bottom here. Um, I can't remember. I think it was Mission Models rail brown. And I came in, I hit the top with a little bit of like uh, weathered black along the top, a little bit of 
soot black along there. Now I'm doing a uh, wash coat with like a panel line wash from uh, MIG. I just kind of lighten that up and put it on there. Uh, I kind of thin it down because I don't like it too, too heavy. Now I'm just coming in with some black acrylic paint. Uh, this, I believe, is airbrush paint is what I used here because it was very, very thin. And I'm painting all my grills completely black uh, because naturally these units tended to get very uh, dirty grills on them. So just coming in with a very fine brush and, and painting all that black. All right, now what I'm doing is I'm taking my, uh, taking a little bit of thinner and I'm kind of wiping down the fuel tank, kind of wiping some of that real brown off the bottom of it. I'm kind of coming in and uh, coming with a little bit of this brown and I'll just kind of paint the trucks and wipe it off, paint the trucks and wipe it off. I'll do a little bit on the fuel tanks too. Um, for you guys that really want to see in-depth weathering, I've done a few videos on weathering locomotives in the past or some stuff, so this was just kind of a basic, you know, paint it on, wipe it off deal. If you guys watched any of my stuff before, and I came in with uh, some markers and just kind of did little, you know, detail here and there on some of the hinges on the uh, boxes and stuff, and just little spots here and there. Also, I did like some stuff on the handrails. A little bit of a chipping kind of thing going on with that as well. So just putting a little bit of a little bit of marks here and there. But that's gonna about do it for this video, guys. Uh, after this, I just clear coat it again, go back in and uh, clean off the trucks and wheels, and then take her over to layout programmer. So I uh, hope you guys enjoyed this. Uh, hope some of you uh, maybe learned something here, or maybe you're just entertained by this. But either way, we're going to go ahead and watch this unit on the layout. As always, thanks for watching, guys. I'll see you next time.